Thank you for joining CIE's weekly analysis of the Hamas-Israel war with the best analysts, scholars, rabbis, journalists, economists, and diplomats from around the world. I'm Ken Stein, the president of the Center for Israel Education and Emory University Emeritus Professor of Contemporary Middle Eastern History, Political Science, and Israel Studies. I'm moderating today's discussion on Israel's 9-11, taking a look at the outbreak of anti-Semitic acts across the country and across the world. Our 22 prior webinars are archived on our website, israeled.org. There are audio and video versions for each webinar. Join our Israel learning community. Visit israeled.org, as do 40,000 viewers each week, for reliable content and analyses about all aspects of Zionism, Israel, its people, culture, and history. We have a very special button on the homepage that deals with the Israel-Hamas war. That'll give you access to all sorts of sources that you might not find elsewhere. As devastating as October 7th was, when Hamas brutally murdered 1,200 Israelis and others and kidnapped more than 240, the pain and shock have grown as Jews in the diaspora have faced a surge of anti-Semitism. Three experts in front of us are on the front lines of dealing with anti-Semitism. National Jewish Advocacy Center CEO, Rabbi Mark Goldfeder, Hillel International General Counsel, Mark Rotenberg, and author and editor, Howard Lovey, who is writing a guide to fighting anti-Semitism. The Center for Israel Education's work is focused on collecting and providing content, perspective, and sources. We undertake learning and teaching without polemics. And if you generally feel you are benefiting from the weekly webinars and the content of the website, please donate to our work. The donate button is on the homepage. As Israel winds into its sixth month of fighting, there was an explosive outbreak of anti-Semitism in Europe, North America, on campus, in social media platforms, in newspapers, and in other outlets. Just today, I got an email from a woman outside of Atlanta who says that her middle school child is being exposed to the wrong kind of information, it almost sounds like anti-Semitism. I would like our guests to take a look at the nature and context of these outbreaks. Where was our society when October 7th took place? Howard, what are your findings in the research that you've done, if you can give us a context? The context is that this has been bubbling up for, for many years, and you can argue as to whether it started with Donald Trump's rise in 2016, when there was a rise in right-wing anti-Semitism that since has kind of jumped to the left wing. But this has been bubbling up on college campuses, everywhere. It's not just anti-Israel, but it's this framing of Israel and Jews in general as colonists, as rich, as puppet masters. And that is the result of this push toward giving a voice to marginalized communities, which is wonderful, but Jews are not considered to be marginalized. We're considered to be part of this kind of ruling class. And as we all know, that's not true. We're 0.2% of the population. So we're not really in charge of anything. So these are ancient anti-Semitic tropes, but they found a brand new audience. The surprising thing about October 7, and it surprised even me, and I've been looking at this most of my career, was the speed October 7 wasn't even history before they were protesting in the streets. Israel hadn't even responded yet when they were calling for more dead Jews on the street. It was well-organized. It was almost like it was pre-planned. It takes some doing to actually organize a protest on the street or, or to organize your talking points or to put out your social media memes that villainize Jews in Israel. October 7 happened, and then a few hours later, bang, there we are on the streets and all these memes and all these talking points that are very repetitive. This tells me that the public perception aspect of it was planned in advance, as well as the actual attacks. Mark Rotenberg, you've been involved on university campuses for much of your life at Minnesota, Johns Hopkins, and now you're at Hillel working with university campuses, trying to help stave off the attacks on students on campus. When you took this position at Hillel, was this the kind of environment that you had encountered, or was this something that just 
exploded onto the scene. My capacity as Vice President General Counsel at Hillel gives me an opportunity to observe in close hand what is happening on our college campuses, which is unprecedented, certainly in the post-World War II period. There had been a perception for several years that anti-Semitism and the marginalization and bullying of Jewish students needed to be addressed in a more comprehensive way. Up until 2013, Hillel didn't even count anti-Semitic incidents on U.S. campuses. As you know, there's a long and sorry legacy of discrimination against Jews in American higher education before World War II. Hillel was founded in 1923 on the campus of the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, to deal with the marginalization, the quotas, the exclusion, the feeling of alienation of Jewish students and faculty in the 1920s and before. We now have over 850 Hillels around the world. But for a long period of time after World War II, anti-Semitism in higher education was really a non-issue for the Jewish community. Hillel began counting anti-Semitic incidents in 2013, and at that time there were 27 incidents. Some people thought that was a lot, actually. This is before I came to Hillel. I came to Hillel in 2019. There's thousands of campuses around the U.S., and 27 incidents indicated was not a crisis. I came on board because the then CEO of Hill International wanted somebody to really focus on this problem and believe that students and local Hillels could not solve the problem on their own. The programs we now run for targeting university administrators and leadership to address the rampant nature of anti-Semitism on their campuses is the first time Hillel International actually focused on something it didn't have directly to do with student service. This program was created because of this increase. So we were aware of the increase well before 10 7 we now do these statistical surveys together with ADL. That showed about 240 incidents in the last academic year, which is an enormous increase from 27. And people were quite alarmed by that. Just since 10-7, Hill has recorded over 1,000 anti-Semitic attacks. So this is a geometric explosion of hostility towards Jewish students and vandalism of Jewish property, including numerous Hillels. What is the reason for this? I would say there are two things. One is the virtual collapse in many spaces, not all, not all, but in many spaces in the Academy of Israel's reputation. The bottom has literally fallen out of reasoned conversation, dialogue, scholarship, discourse on the nature of the state, the people, the government, the national security policies of the state of Israel. A sober conversation about these things has really just fallen off the edge. The second thing that I'm just naming here, and Howard touched on this a moment ago, is the very deep association now in many circles, not everywhere, but in many circles, with the intersectionality concept that people experience various kinds of discrimination that merge together in a set of identities, women, people of color, immigrant communities, and so on, that they share certain characteristics which make them targets for oppression and victimization, and others do the targeting and victimizing. And the Jewish community in many higher ed spaces has now clearly been lumped into this category of the oppressors who do not share any intersectional discrimination characteristics and therefore are not worthy of protection when these kinds of attacks occur. They're not seen as being a minoritized population and our identity has been effectively erased from the history of Jewish people. When I tell people on college campuses that identifying Jews as white just calling Jews white, has never existed in the history of the world except in post-war America. That Jews were not identified as white people in the 19th century in the United States or even during World War I. They were considered a separate group of people, a minoritized and often discriminated group. In Europe, even today, we have four Hillels in Ukraine. If you were to ask any of those students how to identify themselves, or equally important, if you were to ask non-Jewish Ukrainians <laughs> how to identify those Jewish students, none of them would say, those are white people. The terminology is highly idiosyncratic, but within the context of higher education, it's seen as being almost self-evident that Jews share no characteristics that would warrant protection. 
as a minoritized population. So those are the two things that I would name, the bottom dropping out of reasoned discussions about Israel and the erasure of Jewish identity. What have they found in the literary world? This has been building for a number of years. Again, we get at the perception that the Jews are white rather than a marginalized community. The trend has been agents and publishers are looking for people of color, for people who have been marginalized and to amplify their voices, which is wonderful. It's a great trend. But Jews are not considered part of that group. And there's this perception that Jews are overrepresented in the literary world, which if you really look at it, isn't true. Then October 7 happened. And I've been interviewing many Jewish authors who suddenly face bigotry that they hadn't felt before. Even Jews who are not Israeli, don't write about the Middle East, are having doors slammed in their faces. And word in the industry is that they just don't want to hear from Jews right now. People are losing contracts, calls aren't being returned, books are canceled because of a perception in the industry that there's no market for Jewish voices. Unless that market is the so-called hashtag, as a Jew, I reject Zionism, those voices are being welcomed. Those voices are being actually promoted so they can say, see, not all Jews are Zionists, whereas, as we know, 90 to 95 percent are. The Jewish Book Council is gathering data, but it's offering very little right now in terms of practical help. So right now, Jewish authors are shocked, disoriented, and feel like they have no voice. They're in the process right now of giving themselves a voice. We saw recently in Hollywood when the director in his Oscar acceptance speech for the zone of interest decried the war in Gaza. Just a week later, Jewish professionals in Hollywood came out with their own statement distancing themselves from that. There's attempts in the literary community to do that as well. There are all these statements from the literary community condemning Israel for so-called genocide, and some high-profile Jewish authors are among them. And most Jewish authors who are mostly Zionists say, no, they don't necessarily speak for us. But in general, the literary community was completely caught off guard. And I'm hearing tons and tons of anecdotes of harassment at literary events, frank discussions with their agents and publishers saying, we're just going to have to put your book signing on hold. We're going to have to put your book on hold just because Jewish voices are not welcome right now. I'm of the opinion that October 7th did not create anything new. It just revealed a very ugly truth that has always been in existence. Anti-Semitism is a mutating virus, and in terms of its focus, it often looks at Jews as a collective. The idea being that while individual Jews might be tolerable, Jews as a separate collective identity should not be allowed to exist with the same rights as other groups. Jews are always other. They told us in Europe to go back home to Israel. So we did. And now they tell us to go back everywhere we go. You're included. We are not white. And now that whites have less protection, we are white. But in terms of specifically what happened on October 7th, the majority of anti Semitism in any given era, this is a Rabbi Sachs point he used to make, tends to focus on the primary form of collective Jewish identity at that point in time. So throughout the Middle Ages, Jews are hated for their religion because they're mostly a religious community, even if that particular Jew wasn't religious. In the 19th and 20th centuries, when many Jews became secularized, they're hated for their race, even when the assimilated Jews that were being murdered only had a trace amount of Jewish blood. Think about the Nuremberg Laws. And today, when the primary collective identity or embodiment of Jewish people on the world stage is Israel, Jews around the world are hated and held accountable for the actions of their state, even if they're not Israeli. And in each instance, the sort of justification that's used is that we don't hate Jews, we just can't stand X. And today that X is Zionism, except for the fact that Zionism really is part and parcel of, for a large amount of Jews across time and space, their Jewish identity, which makes it a protected characteristic in terms of the law. You simply cannot discriminate against a person because they associate themselves with a real or perceived connection to the state of Israel. And what we're seeing on campuses across, honestly, the entire country is something that gives rise to a potential Title VI claim. Title VI is the part of the 1964 Civil Rights Act that prohibits discrimination in institutions that receive federal funding on the basis of race or national origin. Notice religion is not in there, and so for a long time, Jews were not protected under Title VI. And then in 2004, Ken Marcus, who now is chairman of the Brandeis Center, he was then the assistant deputy secretary at the Office of Civil Rights, which enforces Title VI, wrote a letter which said, look, the vast majority of anti-Semitism that we see on campus has nothing to do with whether someone does or does not light Shabbat candles. It has everything to do with their real or perceived connection 
to the state of Israel. And so we won't not give Jews protections for their race or ethnicity or national origin aspects just because they are also a religion. And so that sort of became part and parcel of Title VI. But there was still a big lacuna in the text, which is how do you define anti-Semitism? And in 2019, Executive Order 13899 answered that question and says you use the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition, one of the examples of which is holding Jews accountable for the state of Israel. So what you're seeing on campus, really, to put it into context, in terms of holding Jews accountable, attacking, demeaning, ostracizing Jewish kids, creating the hostile environments that we're seeing, which universities have an affirmative responsibility to respond to, is a violation of law under Title VI. Is the association because Jews are seen automatically as being Zionists? They're automatically seen as advocates of Israel, forget Israeli policies? Yeah, that's why, again, it's important about the real or perceived connection. I'll tell you an interesting story. Oftentimes, anti-Zionist Jews don't realize that when you're trying to pass, for example, anti-Semitism bills using the IR definition, you're protecting them too. Because just like Hitler didn't really ask whether you did or did not like your Jewish grandparent, anti-Semites don't ask your feelings before they attack. One instance which stands out, the Hanukkah stabbings in 2019, where a person walked into an ultra-Orthodox synagogue that happened to belong to a virulently anti-Zionist sect of Jews and began stabbing people with a machete. When police looked at his computer afterwards, he had searched for Zionist temples in my area. One of the guys in the shul threw a table at the attacker and stopped the attack and saved countless lives. And the ADL wanted to give him what they call their Heroes Award, a $20,000 award. And this man refused to take it, lest he be considered Zionistic for taking an award from the ADL. That was an anti-Zionist Jewish person who was attacked for his real or perceived connection to the state of Israel. Anti-Semites don't often stop to ask your politics before they attack. I've talked to people at the political level who are trying to pass the IHRA definition of, of anti-Semitism on the state level, sometimes to some success and sometimes not. As you know, in your state of Georgia, it was passed successfully. In Indiana, not so much. But what happened in Georgia was that they made friends. The evangelical community, which in Georgia is very strong, was on board with the IHRA definition. So it's a matter of finding allies. We're 0.2% of the worldwide population. So working with other people is incredibly important. But the ally finding is something that we've been trying to do, at least in the United States. I can only speak for my parents who came from Germany, joining organizations in creating alliances or discussion groups with Catholics and with Blacks. And if that's not remembered anymore about Jewish involvement in the civil rights movement is sort of cast aside. History doesn't matter. It's social media that matters. At least that's how I see it as an old-fashioned professor from a university. Mark Rotenberg, tell us about the incidents that are categorized. Tell us what you're recommending to students. What are you providing them as opportunities so that they don't have a fear, so they can report incidents that are considered to be antagonistic or anti-Semitic? In terms of the counting, ADL, as we all know, is very good at counting things. They count anti-Semitic incidents and have done so for decades. We have aligned with, although we don't chiefly rely upon, ADL's gathering of statistics on campuses because we have now a pretty robust way of encouraging students and our Hill professionals to report. They're categorized in a whole variety of ways. We have them categorized by region, by type of school, by number of incidents per school, and so on. But they do not include, I, I want to make this clear, simply a protest. A group of people get together and do a die-in with ketchup on the sidewalk or something. We don't consider that to be an anti-Semitic incident unless it traffics in anti-Semitic tropes. It talks about Jews controlling the media or Jews controlling the university with their money and so forth and so on. So we have a fairly nuanced understanding of what we're talking about. But sadly, sadly, the explosion in these anti-Semitic incidents that have gone from just a few dozen to over a thousand in a few months are related to actual assaults, physical assaults on Jewish students, sending some of them to hospitals vandalism of Jewish property, defacement of Hillel buildings, invasions of Hillel building space. These are crimes, of course, and Hillel has now made it clear that we want crimes against Jewish persons and property 
should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. We're an educational organization, but attacks on Jewish students and their property and our property cannot be allowed to go unpunished. So there's something like 40 some actual assaults on Jewish students since 10 7. There's almost double that number of vandalisms of Jewish property. We, of course, work actively with local law enforcement and the FBI to apprehend and punish these individuals. What are we doing about it? Well, Hillel has two major initiative. One, of course, is focused on students. That's our primary focus. We just the last month had a Israel summit for about 850 students. This is an effort to supplement what used to be the largest gathering of Jewish students in the United States at the APEC Policy Conference, which doesn't exist anymore. But we have a need in our community to gather Jewish students together, physically together, and show them how much pride, how much strength, how much unity, how much enthusiasm we can bring to the characteristics of Jewish identity. Of course, we know that Jewish students manifest their identity in a very diverse way that includes support for Zionism in Israel. So that's a major effort, and we're building that up. I would say within three years, we will be able to approach, if not exceed, the number of Jewish students who used to come to Washington every year. This is more important now, of course, than ever before. The second thing we do for students on campus is helping support Jewish students be knowledgeable about their background. It's not only non-Jews who need to know who was Theodor Herzl and who was Jabotinsky and so on. It's Jewish students who need to know something about that as well. So we support Jewish students enhancing their knowledge and awareness of Israel and of celebrating their Jewish identities, which is the core function that Hillel has served for over 100 years. On the administration side, which is the programs that I'm responsible for, we now have over 75 universities engaged in the Campus Climate Initiative, which works with university presidents and administrators to help them become aware of what Mark just described, their legal responsibilities under Title VI and related state and local laws to protect Jews as a minoritized community on campus, and also to help universities fulfill their mission. Because nine times out of 10, notice I didn't say 10 times out of 10, these administrators are not raging anti-Semites. They simply don't know how to handle a bias report that's filed by a Jewish student that alleges anti-Semitism because their DEI offices, their Title IX offices, their anti-discrimination offices of various sorts, even their general counsel's offices, don't have any capacity to understand anti-Semitism and how should it be addressed. So when students file a bias report, it goes into a black hole. So we're working on the administration side and we're working on the student side to make sure that these students can express their diverse Jewish identities without fear of marginalization and bullying. And one last note here, the preservation of the dignity and pride that Jewish students need to have in their identity, however they express it, Hillel is a pluralistic organization, is the core of what we must maintain. And I hope that your listeners will appreciate that that is a very severe challenge. I know Howard has written about how this is a K-12 issue as well, and I'm not trying to diminish that at all, but just locate the problem in higher ed, which, of course, has gotten more news. What do we do about what goes on in the classroom by individual professors who have virtual autonomy to use their teaching podium for preaching and for advocating items that could be considered anti-Zionist or anti-Israeli or even anti-Semitic. What kind of remedies are there, Mark? Sure. There's a lot in that question. Because we mentioned the Georgia law, I just want to give a shout out. We have Elliot Karp here, who was the director at Hill when we started testifying and gave some incredibly passionate testimony about the bill. Leslie Anderson, others on here who really helped get the bill passed in Georgia. And it's just a reminder of what happens when you persevere. It took five years from start to finish to get the bill passed. 
And since that time, it has been adopted by counties across the state. We just had a massively important and successful win in Fulton County just last week that really, really had an incredible impact. So thanks to everyone who helped out locally on that as well. One of the most common responses that you will get if you try to file a Title VI complaint about a professor is that the professor has what we call academic freedom. And if you're taking notes, here's why that response is generally wrong. From a legal perspective, the Court of Appeals in the Sixth Circuit once very succinctly explained, there's a case called Bunnell versus Lorenzo. The professor's rights to academic freedom and freedom of expression are paramount, but they are not absolute to the point of compromising a student's right to learn in a hostile, free environment, which brings us right back to Title VI. They do not have the ability to violate a person's Title VI rights. To quote Carrie Nelson, who is the president of the American Association for University Professors, academic freedom doesn't mean that a professor can harass or intimidate or ridicule or impose his or her own views on students. And that is precisely what is happening on campuses across the country, which brings us to the next point, which is there's a difference between education and indoctrination. Instructors indoctrinate when they teach particular propositions as if they are dogmatically true. Again, I'll go back to Ken Marcus on this. He once explained there's a difference between a professor sharing a personal opinion versus presenting that opinion as incontrovertible fact. In fact, the first Supreme Court case that ever discussed academic freedom was a case called Sweezy versus New Hampshire. It was 1957. The court said teachers and students must always remain free to inquire, to study, to evaluate. Otherwise, our civilization will stagnate and die. So what happens actually on campuses now is the exact opposite of academic freedom. When faculty members are stating their positions on Israel as non-negotiable truths, permitting a teacher to cast these sort of biased falsehoods as fact while consistently mocking and shutting down an exploration of alternative viewpoints, that actually violates everything that academic freedom, if it's properly interpreted, is supposed to protect. And I'll add just one more thing, which is academic freedom also doesn't protect disciplinary incompetence. And some of what we're seeing, some of the lies that are being told are so incredibly outrageous that they actually do cross that line by quite a lot. So that's the answer I would give for academic freedom. Does an individual student have the right to appeal someplace on campus to indicate that he or she has been intimidated by a presentation or a view, which the professor said was incontrovertible? What does a student do and how should he or she do it? I'll give two things. Number one, if this is happening, you should definitely report it. Hill International, the Brandeis Center, the ADL, and Gibson Dunn have a call hotline where you can report these types of instances. And it's important to report them because part of what Title VI requires is a pattern that is severe and pervasive. And the severe and the pervasive, it's sort of a balancing option between how severe and how pervasive. But sometimes a student won't even know that across campus, there are 10 other students who are experiencing this type of thing as well. And it's what's important to report that they are aggregated properly. You don't always want to file your own bias report because Title VI, incredibly enough in its regulation, has a reverse jurisdiction clause, which means that if you file a bias report, the Office of Civil Rights might say someone else is taking care of it, so we're no longer going to allow you to file a complaint with us. But in terms of when you actually decide to file a complaint, that's actually the only proper invocation of academic freedom in this context is for the school to acknowledge that the students' rights to academic freedom are being violated when they are force-fed indoctrination when they're denied the opportunity to express themselves, when their opinions are summarily dismissed and shut down, and when they're punished for merely expressing them. So pattern and repetition is what is needed in reporting. This is a standard that's drawn from the Title IX cases. So if something is incredibly severe, I have one case on a campus where a group of SJP students threatened a Jewish kid with a gun. That's so severe, it doesn't need to be pervasive. And then there are times where there are a number of horrible comments made. Those aren't as severe, but if they're pervasive enough, it's a balancing test between the two. But it's important because any one student may not know the full extent to try and report it to some central authorities. Where do you see this trajectory going? Can it be slowed down? Can it be remedied? If you had a dollar to spend, would you spend it on fighting and playing defense against the anti-Semitic acts? Would you spend the dollar in increasing Jewish identity? Where would you put the priority? 
This is a great question, and it's, it really points to some of the ultimate issues that American Jewish community must face. It comes up in the literature with increasing frequency, and mostly in Jewish media, but it has seeped into actual mass media and social media conversations. Certainly, it exists at the dinner table. There are many Jewish people now who believe that higher ed is a lost cause. And in fact, the cover story in this month's Atlantic by one of my fellow synagogue members here in Washington, D.C., Frank Foyer, is that the best days of the Jewish community in North America are over. That is an increasing sentiment by many, many excellent observers of the Jewish experience here in the United States, that it's a lost cause, that higher ed is going to become increasingly inhospitable to Jewish students. It won't surprise you that Hillel does not concede the point. Our students need our support, deserve our protection, and are entitled to an equal educational opportunity under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. And we are going to stand and fight and we have had inside Hillel, I won't mention the particular school, a Hillel lay board consisting of alumni and donors and people who take great pride in the Jewish students at this particular institution, decide that there was so much anti-Semitic sentiment at that campus and the administration was so recalcitrant and unwilling to address Jewish student needs that they were going to pull up stake and remove Hillel from that campus. And they were going to slam that university in the media by saying that it's so toxic that we're leaving. We changed that 180 degrees. We persuaded the board of that local Hillel to stand and fight. And I think in the next week or two, you're going to see legal action against that institution. Hillel International's view is this may be a dire time. The Jewish community on campuses across the United States has never faced this since World War II, certainly. But the idea that we're going to pull up stakes and give up and concede to the anti-Semites, to the bullies, that our best days are over is not something that Hill will collaborate on. We are going to insist on proud, self-respecting, intelligent, and knowledgeable expressions of Jewish identity across a very wide spectrum, from Chabad to secular expressions. And we're going to celebrate that. And we're going to persuade using carrots and some sticks, we're going to persuade leaders of American higher ed institutions that that is their mission and that is their legal duty. One thing that I think is really important that we briefly touched upon in a few different contexts is this question of when anti-Zionism becomes anti-Semitism. A lot of us who are having this discussion often assume that everyone knows the difference and people don't. I'll give you a very practical tip, a shorthand that you can use in almost any context to determine if a particular decision or statement or movement about Israel involves anti-Semitism. And it's just helpful to apply what's called the 3D test. The test, which actually formed part of the basis for the IRA definition, is a set of questions designed by the Israeli politician and human rights activist Natan Sharansky as a tool to distinguish between legitimate criticism of Israel on the one hand and thinly veiled hatred of Jews on the other. And it works like this. Classic anti-Semitism has always involved demonizing Jews by accusing them of horrible things, from deicide to blood libels to, in the current context, killing innocent children, delegitimizing the Jewish collective identity, whether that collective identity was cast in the religious terms of the Middle Ages or the race-based approach of the 19th, 20th centuries, or the national framework of today. And finally, the application of double standards for Jewish people. So for instance, the numerous specific laws enacted against Jewish people throughout the various countries, or the ostracization of Israel today at the UN. So those three Ds, demonization, delegitimization, and double standards, those are the three main weapons that anti-Semites throughout history have typically used when they're making their case against Jews. And nowadays, when some anti-Semites like to masquerade as merely anti-Zionist, that line between the acceptable critique of a democratic country and that thinly veiled hatred isn't always as apparent. But all you have to do is ask yourself if the proponents of any given statement or position are making use of those same three classic tools. Sharansky once explained it in a very cute way. If you watch a 3D movie without 3D glasses, you see a blurred partial picture. But when you put on your 3D glasses, everything becomes clear. And that's the point of the 3D test for anti-Semitism, which can easily help you distinguish between legitimate criticism and anti-Semitism. So when activists or others use these classic anti-Semitic tropes to discuss the collective Jew among the nations as a proxy for how anti-Semites have historically talked about Jews, that's anti-Semitism.
I love the 3D thing. I spoke with Nathan Sharansky last year about that. It's a great, succinct way to try to explain to people the difference between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Uh, the other thing I'll say is that every person I've interviewed for this book so far is noting the lack of an existing resource like this. Many Jews are in need of practical advice in dealing with this crisis. I personally decided to do it after going through my own various stages of grief after October 7. Well, what can I do personally? And the only thing I know how to do reasonably well is write. So that's what I'm doing. But there's this need for us all to not feel alone and to know that there's a larger community out there that has their back. And so what I'm doing is showing people the success stories. These are people who are using Title VI to successfully fight anti-Semitism on campus. These are people who are raising their voices, sometimes at the expense of their own careers and threats to their lives. One young person told me that he needed role models for action. They want to see success stories and they want to know what works besides getting angry. And believe it or not, I'm actually coming out of this project with a little more hope than when I started. It sounds like we're going to remain resilient, which is probably about as close as one can find to the despair that Israelis feel, but they're also feeling highly resilient. They're running into this fire and they're committed because they have no other place to go to maintain their identity. Thank you so much for bringing real light to a pretty dark issue.